All right, here we go. Surprise slide. Um, yes, uh, so this is Scholar War Stories. There will be slides like this one uh, with people's faces and quotes. Please just shout out if you know who they are. This one is Donald Rumsfeld. <laughs> This is the slide that says who I am for the very first time. I'm still Paul Phillips, uh, still working on Scholarly for the last five years, uh, still not speaking for TypeSafe, but still employed at TypeSafe for the time being. Uh, and yeah. And I worked very hard on these slides, and most of that work is invisible. So this is not the product of like lots of hard work. It's, what's, it's the residue of the product of lots of hard work. So it's very much not the same thing. And the reason it worked out like that is that I kept getting, like trying to chase down a terribly difficult problem that had plagued us for years. So of course, that's not exactly the quickest process. And I'd get to the point where the war story would be and determine that it was our self-inflicted, you know, shooting our own feet. That's not a good war story to me. Like, there should be something legitimate you were up against, right? I mean, some external factor that you had to work around. Somebody else made this happen, not like I did it to myself. So because I had to cut all those, there wasn't as much left as I would have liked. <laughs> um, it says that if you find your time has been ill-spent, I owe you dinner. Nobody collected on that at JVM Lang, maybe because I was impossible to find. Um, but that, that's a genuine offer if you can find me tonight. Uh, in case you've never heard of Scala and are here for some reason, maybe on just pure hype, that is a little chart of languages and uh, to ever look at that. This is like everybody else, right? Because that's like a whole little cool kid group. And then there's a good size gap. And then there's us right out in front. You can't even see closure here, which I cut right there so the closure would just miss. Um, <laughs> uh, oh, we, we, what difference is it? it it's upward moving chart. What is axis? <laughs> Stop with your focus on extraneous details. Look at that line. Uh, I honestly don't. The axis is something weird like number of things on GitHub and number of things on Stack Overflow. I don't know. It made no sense to me. It doesn't matter. The important thing was that they clustered the way that I wanted for this slide. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the source material is Redmonk from like last month. So you know you can just decide how legitimate that is. I don't know. And then uh, that's my personal credentials. That's the bonfire into which I have burned off the last five years of my life. Um, yeah, that's, that's it. That's, all. that's my resume. Like, if I was sending out resumes, that's what I would put. So either hire me on this or don't, because I got nothing else. <laughs> we are, our time is in large part, well, in large part, there haven't been that big an us. But even now, when there is a bit of an us, uh, our time is completely swallowed by the rest of the compiler. We never get a lot of time to really think about bytecode, maybe until recently. So there are issues that we have that, again, like the aforementioned foot shooting business, uh, that, you know, that people with greater sophistication might say, like, what'd you do it that way for? That was not wise. And they would probably be right. So this is all just kind of disclaimer to that end that like, we under, you know, I understand anyway and acknowledge the, uh, that inexpertise is the source of a lot of our difficulties. Uh, but even so, they remain difficulties. So there we are. Yeah, but it's hard to, it's really hard to communicate like to what extent the implementation has determined uh, how things have worked out for the last five years. Because the difference between a language implementation where you can say, well, I wonder how things would work out if we did things slightly differently and just try it and the kinds where you have that same thought, but then a week later, you haven't been able to make it do it slightly differently without exploding all over the place is very large because your opportunity to actually investigate and explore is very low. You're just thrilled to get anything working, and then you're tempted to run with that. So war stories could possibly include friendly fire, uh, you know, generals like, you know, paths of glory ordering you to you know, do the unwinnable charge, uh, third parties pitting armies against one another. That's, that translates to like companies wanting, you know, stuff in the language that's very much to their interest, but maybe not in the general interest. Uh, 
And you know, we have a lot of, of charging machine gun nests on horseback. Uh, the, the long and the short of it is though, I like these are attempting to get to the ones that are not all those things and are more like legitimate. There's a thing, you know, there's a, some kind of fortress and we need to get over the fortress so that we can have working equality or whatever. All right, it's your first opportunity. <laughs> Who's that? No Googling. <laughs> Uh, yes, that's right. <laughs> uh, the fog of war, um, so applicable for us. Uh, what's it, uh, Carl von Clausewitz? Uh, <clears throat> so we have a, a number of constraints that complicate everything in the stories to come here. Um, the biggest one and the fuzz most fuzzily defined is Java interop. But uh, closely uh, competing for the biggest problem is separate compilation. So by this mean, we mean uh, we can't choose an encoding for things. When we're trying to take elements of the Scala language and make them work at the bytecode level, we, we're, we don't have the luxury of choosing an encoding that would require seeing two source files at once. You've got to be able to compile this one and then compile this one and have it work. This inflicts a great deal of pain. Um, furthermore, uh, you know, to, to have to interoperate with Java when Java expects bytecode that very much models sort of the Java language, that's the luxury they have in Java is that bytecode is sort of a translation of the Java language. When you write protected in Java source, you get protected in the bytecode. So not only is like basically the whole world is out there kind of expecting things to go that way, we can't do things that way at all. And then, you know, the, the last sort of the catch-all saving your life, if you could do it, is to be able to rewrite bytecode at runtime. That gets increasingly tempting, especially because guys like Jay Ruby have had reasonable success doing that. But historically, that's been too great a requirement to impose. So we don't have that either. And then, and then just to make sure that it's impossible to achieve these things simultaneously, uh, binary compatibility. You'll see an example of why binary compatibility is hopeless in the face of things like separate compilation. So most of this, uh, what's in this talk and a hundred other things that could have gone into this talk come down to the, the path from here's something we dreamed up for Scala the language and here's something we have to make work on the JVM, the platform. Um, the, the degree to which sort of, you know, if your head is, is a little bit too far in the clouds relative to the platform you're going to run on or if you have an ideal in mind that it's like, works great on paper, uh, it, it can be quite painful when you actually get down to having to make these things go. Um, and you know, it's nice, we're all tempted to live in a world where just the application of intellect can solve all your problems. Uh, but in many times, there's so many constraints that you have been boxed into a box that you cannot unbox. And, and I mean that literally too, when we get to boxing, that's a problem. So <laughs> let's see an actual one. Okay, I should, I should preface this one with that quote is misattributed, so, but it's still such a good quote that I can't <laughs> help but give it to him. That's Trotsky, that's correct. And the, the actual quote, of course, is war, except it's the actual misquote because he didn't actually say that. And what he really said is you may not be interested in the, the, what do they call it, the dialect or the dialectical, whatever the, but the dialect is interested in you. Anyway. So why, why are things hard for us? Well, so Scala the language does what is always appealing uh, when you are looking at a mass of irregularities. Make it regular. That does make life easier at the top. Um, so where Java has three distinct namespaces, we have one. Um, where Java has uh, basically any given thing involving primitives has to be done separately than any given thing involving references, we have one model, one object model. Um, where Java, everything involving arrays has to be done separately. The array has to be enumerated. And where we say, hey, array is just a collection. <laughs> a great deal of suffering is tied to that one. And uh, where Java has like, well, we've got primitive types, but then we also have this thing void, which isn't really a type. It's like the absence of a type. 
except it should have been a type because it is sort of a type. Uh, and anyway, we'll, we'll take void null and the absence of completion and give them, put them in the type system. Unit, null, and nothing. We call these two the bottom types. You could have more bottom types, but those are the only ones we have. And uh, yeah, this sort of stands in for this. For, now this is, this is a type that has exactly one value, and comically it has, uh, at various times, it had several forms of boxing. So there's boxed unit, rich unit, um, <laughs> and there was some other kind of unit going too. And all of these actually turned up in bytecode, all trying to handle that one unit. So the problem with making the irregular regular, because it sounds good, and it is good if you can do it, the problem is you must eliminate the distinction completely. You cannot get 80% of the way there, 90, 95% of the way there, or you will find uh, that there is code that takes advantage of the distinction, intentionally often, unintentionally often, but one way or another, things happen differently based on which side of that distinction things are. So when you say, well, let's just make it so you can't even see that distinction. I'll, all of a sudden, your very double-edged sword is cutting everybody who needs to see that because there is a difference, and now you've made it impossible, right? You've become the enemy. You're standing in the way of seeing the difference. And so they have a problem they can't solve because you're out there saying, nope, doesn't matter, can't see. <laughs> um, and this arises in many contexts. And yes, I've never, never seen anybody manage to actually eliminate the distinction. I mean, never. So here's a good one in the like stuff you just are never going to think of up front. Well, I say that. That's not fair. Some people would. I'd never think of this up front. This one is I, I, can, I cannot cast any aspersions on anyone for not thinking of this. Java has this weird. Uh, uh, decision they made at some point, maybe the best decision available to them at the time, NAN is never supposed to be equal to NAN. That's like the definition of NAN. It's like if this thing starts entering your calculations, you want it to always be unequal. And then somebody noticed, well, that means if you stick a NAN key in a map, you can never get it back out. Okay, well, I don't know how great a tragedy that is, but uh, <laughs> on that basis, the box NAN is equal to the, to the box NAN. So if you say box NAN dot equals box NAN, it's true. Well, so and then we walk in and say, there's only one thing. Box NAN, unbox NAN, it's just NAN. Well, then is NAN equal NAN? <laughs> That's an actual picture of me from uh, any, any point in history, mostly. <laughs> Uh, what you mean? What it, what is the answer today? <laughs> uh, pretty sure. It, well, I mean, I'm pretty sure it acts like the primitive. So we may actually get to recover the boxed behavior by uh, if if I well. So I had an idea that we could define eek the reference equality thing on any, so that it was available universally. And if we did that, then we could have eek be the boxed answer and the regular equals be the primitive answer, and then we'd actually recover reasonable semantics. That hasn't happened yet, though, but I, I sort of expect that to happen, I guess. It's one of the least controversial things that I have in the fire. <laughs> um, so packages. So one, one of the places where Scala did not go the, like, let's have fewer things route, but let's have more things route, uh, and to a very large number, uh, is access. Java has four levels of access. Uh, public, package, which is the default, protected, and private. And so we said, let's throw a bunch more in there. Um, but one thing that is strange, that is even though we threw a ton more out there, we still have no way to express one of the Java ones. Um, this, I'm fairly sure, is not intentional. Uh, but you can see that those two little examples of Java and Scala right there are, to the extent that it's possible to write it in Scala, are the same thing. But they're not the same thing in a very important way as this, if you were ever to encounter it, would reveal to you. Because in Java, packages don't nest. But in Scala, everything nests. So if you're in package foo.bar in Scala, 
you're also in package foo. But if you're in package foo.bar in Java, you are not in package foo. You're in a completely unrelated package to package foo. Um, so there's an example of how that gets you. It has also pervaded sort of the, the, the intersection of Java interop, trying to interoperate with Java, where access is like a real thing, and Scala, where we have both like much more complicated access, but a complete inability to encode it at the JVM level, which shares Java's idea of there being exactly four levels. So what we have to do is everything's public and enforce it in Scala. Um, this has issues of its own. Um, but then when you have stuff like Java calling into Scala, Scala calling into Java, uh, you know, that can be arbitrarily nested. And then you combine it with this stuff, well, forget it. It's bad. <laughs> This is a perfect example of the uh, problem with like having more ambition in your model than your platform will support. Churchill, that's correct. I, I wish he'd said it exactly this way. Because <laughs> it's so true. Never, never, never believe any feature will be smooth and easy or that anyone who embarks on the strange voyage can measure the tides and hurricanes he will encounter. Anybody who's attempted to have any kind of project with a timeline over a week can probably get behind that. All right, so here's another fun one with Java. So, so we say there's no, we're not going to have this, this huge barrier between reference types and primitive types. There's, there's a thing at the top, it's called any. And then to the left go the any vowels. That's all the primitives. And to the right go the any refs, and that's all the reference types. But we also interoperate with Java. Well, when we see a piece of Java code and it accepts object or type parameter or bounded by object especially, what did they mean when they wrote that? Because maybe they really wanted to say uh, any, because they probably very likely they did. It's just that object is the best they could do to say any, or to write just a type parameter, t, with no bound expressed. Java it says, OK, you mean t bounded by object. But that's not really what they wrote. That's Java being helpful, saying that's all you can write. Um, in any case, uh, the question is, like these things, again, ide written identically, don't mean the same thing. Or maybe they don't mean the same thing. We actually don't know if they mean the same thing. So maybe you think, why does it matter? Well, it matters for, because Java makes a lot of distinctions between things, or the JVM in particular makes a lot of distinctions between things, and we are in, on thin ice if we try to eliminate those distinctions. For instance, and this syntax, if you haven't seen it, means an array of something unknown, which is a subtype of any, or respectively any ref. Um, in Java, you would just write array object, because their arrays are covariant, unsoundly. We did not inherit that particular quirk, but that means that if you want to say an array of something without allowing for essentially covariant behavior without it being a covariant type, you have to write it like that. Point being that if we assume that like, you know, it means the one, then we can do put in the bytecode, we can put that it's an array of objects because it's safe to say that it is. But if we assume that it means an array of anything, that encompasses all the primitive arrays too, which don't actually share any supertype, except for like serializable, as somebody pointed out last time. It's true. It's like they're serial. So we could erase the serializable, but the point is that you can't you can no longer erase to array object if it's if it might be array any because it could be an array of int, which is a very different look signature wise. It's like I brackety thing instead of big old reference typey thing. Point being, again, Distinction exists. If we say, nope, no distinction, then we walk into all these uh, linkage errors at the JVM level. Bottom types are even worse. That, that method up there, uh, I'm writing a function and accepts an array of something that's a subtype of string. So it thinks, well, What's it going to be except an array string? Of course it's an array string. It's string's final. But so like, how many subtypes could it possibly have? Well, actually, it's got a whole bunch. Um, now, here's the trick. Those types, subtypes of string that aren't string, uh, that they're, generally speaking, they're uninhabited. So in, if, if you were demanding a value of that type, you would be safe because there is no value of that type. That's what uninhabited means. 
But arrays have now, they, they'll take the uninhabited and reify it as a real thing, even if there's no value of that type. That's a big problem. That's type system death. Um, basically, it means that arrays should never have uh, gotten as far in being treated as like just another thing, uh, nearly as far as they have. They should have been walled off in a, you know, like, like the freakish brother in a tower somewhere, and you throw food through the window. Uh, <laughs> but you, you never let them just mix with all the other collections like you're all one big happy family because you're definitely not one big happy family. Um, as this example, among many others, uh, will reveal. Uh, uh, the array nothing is just one possibility in Scala, but um, again, there are many, many actual, uh, infinitely many subtypes of string. It's just that you can't come up with values of those types. So the comment at the bottom there where there's slow motion no guy saying, no, more, brid more bridges, no. Uh, the, uh, I guess uh, the, uh, our, our, that should look better. <laughs> That's not how text looks on my monitor. Um, but uh, as you can get the gist, there's 34 method signatures in there implementing the same method. Uh, they're all implementing seek. So when you fire up a list, if you go digging out all the method, you know, all the signatures that can be found in there, that's how many can be found in there for one method. Uh, and the reason there are all those is that uh, it's got a whole bunch of parents, which themselves have a bunch of parents, which are refining the type as it goes down. And each time you covariantly improve the return type of seek, you need another bridge. Because the JVM says, hey, we knit everything. And uh, this is, as Brian likes to put it, Brian gets a uh, uh, Yesterday's solutions are today's problems. <laughs> this was yesterday's bridge methods as being implemented by the compiler uh, was yesterday's solution, uh, definitely today's problem. Because the VM really has knows enough that it could work this out without us having to go through this pain, not to mention all the failures of correctness that we have uh, with bridge methods. This, this is like the good situation where at least they all appear to be there. All right, so this is back to that other example again. So just in case you thought that, like, well, they don't have a nothing type, because that's the problem. That's not the problem. The problem is a type system that's richer than the type system around which the, the Java Virtual Machine was designed. So uh, you, it, it just does not have a concept of this idea of like subtyping without subclassing. But we have you know, these intersection types. You can make up anything you want. Int with string, that's a perfectly valid type. It's uninhabited, but it's valid. It's a real type. But that's not a problem until you have this type that says, well, I'm going to make that thing you know, like a real part of our lives and let it propagate around and then be able to read it back in and do stuff with it. And that's, you, that can't happen. <laughs> so this is the particular uh, failure that we have right here. Um, that's just our own doing, right? I mean, what it needs to do is just erase basically every array to object. But there's a big problem with that. And that goes back to Java interop. We don't have any way to make Scala accessible from Java except method signatures and descriptors. So if we erase everything down to object, all of a sudden Java's like, what? Oh, there's nothing there. Uh, I got an object. And so you're on your own casting stuff back into arrays on the, jo on the Java side. People are like, what kind of interop is this? Well, yeah, it's not very good interop, but we have this problem that's not really solvable. So. Type system cannot actually be implemented in its real form. We can enforce lots of stuff in Scala. Uh, in principle, we can, like, as long as you do nothing but use Scala, we can make an awful lot of stuff work because we can implement restrictions on top of the platform. We don't need the platform itself. But when it comes to talking to Java, we don't have that luxury. And so uh, we are constrained by what's possible, <laughs> which is not enough. Are there any questions at this point? I, I know people are probably not taking like a questiony mood, but I, you know, I don't know if it's too fast, too slow, anything. So I would, yeah. I don't know why not. Um, I mean, I think there should be a version of the Scala compiler for anything you want. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not real restrictive in that way, but. Uh, I don't know. Like it, that would not be that would not work very well out of the box. You would need more more sophistication applied to the problem than that. Um, but something that lets you have more control over how these things took place, like whether Java interop mattered at all, for instance, that would be very useful. Would you recommend parts of the Scala program be written in Java to avoid? 
Oh, absolutely, 100%. I would, like if Java Interop was of interest to me, I would never just say, well, we'll just write it in Scala and hope that everything is cool, because it never will be. Like, you cannot have, give a, it's, it's very much like, um, you know how people used to imagine they could write their program once and then compile, you know, like, I don't know, in Swing or something, or AWT, and it will be on all the platforms and everybody will, and there's never been a good piece of software written, right, that's like a, got a GUI that's cross-platform, right? I mean, I, we can quibble, but plus or minus, we had like zero examples in history. Everybody that wants to write a decent piece of software, uh, you know, goes to, does the native thing on each place. Uh, this is just as true of Java and Scala, more true even, than it is of like Windows and Mac. This this will this will probably be the most impressive if you know who that is. He's a great thinker, uh, very worthwhile reading. Gets you thinking differently about programming and maybe everything else too. Mm, that's not a bad guess, but no, it's uh, it. Uh, see, I'm not German, so I, uh, Wittgenstein. <laughs> uh, um, he has some more famous quotes among these circles, things like the limits of my language or the limits of my world. Anyway, I recommend him. So this was the, uh, this uh, originally was next to the other slide about unification because these are the places where, some places, a small set of places, where we have expanded beyond what Java offers, more access levels, more parents, more bottom types, <laughs> more XML literals. <laughs> more kinds of uh, evaluation semantics. That, that, that's a little mean right there to, because you know stream and uh, views are library things. But even so, there are three distinct ways of encoding laziness to, you know, uh, with different semantics, each of them, uh, within the language. Then there's variance, always an endless pile of joy. Variance is beyond, uh, like variance is so useful. It's like of all these things where like I look like, oh God, the complexity. But at least variance delivers a tremendously useful uh, payload. And then of course, if it wasn't enough, macros. But I can't really count macros when I'm like trying to slag off the language because they're experimental. But they're, they're experimental, but on the other hand, they've been proved so useful. Have anybody used SBT 013? Oh God, it's such a huge improvement. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without macros. Why is it better? Syntax, like ability to manage your, like basically you can just, in a little build.sbt, you can have like, you can fire off like 10 projects and have all the dependencies work and everything and it's all just like, like you'd like to write it, not this like Baroque crazy syntax, right? Like, you know, let's say you've got like a property and it depends on two other things. Instead of having to like build up this little function bippy, you can just say like Scala version dot value and just stick it right in there and sort of like the direct syntax and it just works. It translates to the other thing, but you don't have to see that anymore. I've been a big critic of SBT. SBT 013 is a huge improvement. At war with the primitives. I'm really bad about clocks, so can somebody give me a hint of like how much time I've got? Two ten before and five before. Oh, thank you. All right, so one of the first like major uh, land wars in Asia that I undertook uh, with Scala C was uh, trying to work uh, make primitives do something sensible because I showed up between two seven and two eight, and uh, you know they didn't do sensible things. So. I was trying to bring everything together and deal with stuff like this, right? Does one equal one? Well, it depends on who you ask, <laughs> right? Uh, one equals one, uh, one long the primitive equals one int the primitive in our language and their language. But in their language, as you can see, one the long the box does not equal one integer the box, but we don't have that distinction. We need those to be equal. So, okay, so when you write x double equals y, if those things happen to be boxed, like this one happened to be, because you don't know, it could be anything. If they happen to be boxed primitives, you need to get in there before equals is called. You know, it's too late otherwise, right? So what we do is say, all right, if it looks like they might be, then we'll get in there and we'll write it differently. So here is an example of what went wrong. 
This is Scala 277. It doesn't act like this anymore. Um, the first one uh, uh, attempts to just compare two things that could be anything. Second one compares two things that happen to be serializables, chosen very specifically. The, the drama unfolds. <laughs> False! How could this happen? The, you have to remember that there was a, a slide about coffee and like many a slip, Twix cup in the lip for that to make any sense. There's probably too great a, a gap in there. You're like, why is, what is going on? So that's, that is, represents, oops, I spilled my coffee on the way to my mouth. Um, so what happened? Uh, well, uh, if you depend on like spotting any possible scenario where they might be boxed things, then you had better get it right. And since Serializable happens to be, you know, one of the super types of Java Lang Long and Java Lang Integer. They could sneak in that way, and the logic at the time was something along the lines of check all the box types specifically and any ref, but not the types in between. So, <clears throat> and that's what I was just saying. <laughs> Now, even the success story here, such as it is, might be, if you have performance as a thing you ever think about, might be making you say, what do you do? Do you do that on every comparison? Are you guys nuts? <laughs> well, <clears throat> you take one step down a road like this, and so the problem you have is like, you got guys like me that just want to make things consistent. Like, whatever, whatever it is you're going to do, let's just make it behave in a predictable way. That's a dangerous guy to have, me, that guy, right? Because that means if you got anything floating around where the logical consequence is you know, some terrible end of the road, well, it's like you started us down that road, but I'm going to finish it no matter how bad it is. And so that's, a <laughs> that's not always good. It's been, you should got to be careful with the first step around guys like that. Who is what? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that one is, is quite obscure. That was John Adams, not usually recognizable by picture. But by name, he is. So of course, any problem you have with equals, you now have an equivalent or possibly worse, in this case, problem with hash code. Because they've got a sort of, you know, I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me. Um, well, so what's the hash code of 1? Well, if you ask integer, he says 1. If you ask long, he says 1. If you ask double, he says 107.269.3248. I, so, we have another dramatic reveal. True, one does equal one. False. <laughs> Still a problem. Now, this is only a problem maybe if you're using boxed uh, numerics as hash table keys, which you're totally not supposed to do. Who knows what you're supposed to do in these situations, right? Like, I don't know. Can you just discourage doing something? But I mean, equal objects must have equal hash codes, right? Like, that's the deal. So this is, again, like we're getting sucked down this road. So hash code became a bigger problem because we didn't have a layer of indirection. We were able to intercept calls to equals by defining double equals as the thing you have to call and then saying, we'll rewrite it before it gets to equals. But people were all, we didn't have such a thing for hash code. Everybody's calling hash code directly. So it's already too late before we can get in there and rewrite hash code. So we had to come up with a different method, give ourselves some indirection, and then define it around that. And that's, you can't see it in this font, but it's, it's you know, whatever you call that thing, sharp, sharp, hash, hash. Uh, so that's another method. We had, we had to stick on any so that there would be a variation of hash code uh, that is like hash code, except that it gives the correct answer for a sum numerics. Of course, we run right into the limits of actual possibility very quickly. So it only is able to do it for the range of like shorts. It's like minus 32K to plus 32K. Beyond that, you're on your own. <laughs> We've run out of like physical reality has imposed. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure you can fit like, you know, double, which goes to like the 307th power or something uh, into 32-bit hash code, so we're, you know, we're just going to lose. Especially when you start looking at the equality behavior of doubles and floats as you start moving up, you'll see the claim themselves equal to you know, wide ranges of other types. It's, a, it's completely inconsistent, non-transitive, madness sort of equality. That, and then here you are trying to mimic that and forget it. That's a, a uh, real disassembly of what happens with these methods, 
One of them is comparing two completely unknown things, and the other is comparing bippies. Well, the, the logic that recognizes numerics knows that none of them are bippies. So it's fully prepared if you are comparing bippies to just inline the minimum uh, extraneous logic, which you may notice is still more than nothing. Do you know what we have to do? Can you see it in the bytecode there? When, if you say x double equals y, why we can't just call equals? <laughs> it's in opcode 4 there is the big one. <laughs> if not, null. Um, if you just blindly forward to equals, then you get a null pointer exception if the left operand is null. So the, the logic, if we know they're not numerics, is equivalent to if the left operand is null, then it's equal if the right operand is null. Otherwise, call equals on the left. This is. Then this is the failure case where like we don't know, so we're calling, this is a static method call. I snipped the part where it says invoke static. That's a static method call sending the operands off for a long and uh, Byzantine route through boxes runtime, uh, looking to find out what they are and, and uh, what their relationship is. <laughs> Sun That's right, Sun Tzu. <clears throat> and uh, there, there is no part of this talk that relates to this quote as given in any way, unfortunately. Uh, however, it's uh, certainly true, so as perhaps in some future talk. <laughs> All right, this is where we're going to learn why we put our heads down and, and cry when we hear about binary compatibility. Now, that's trait B. Private this means this is not allowed to be visible outside of this instance. And it can't be visible outside of B. It is literally completely inaccessible by anything, according to the Scala language semantics, because that's the end of B. It's done. Nothing anywhere can possibly legally access M. The two words in red I draw your attention to, public. That is the interface that you get if you write that trait. That's the interface that X will implement. That is what will be in the bytecode. And that is your binary compatibility contract. Notice things like M and int encoded. Your private this inaccessible everywhere is now like in exactly the way that it is unchangeable. It cannot be touched without breaking binary compatibility. This is the implementation class. The, the, the compilation model for traits is that they are all split into two things. One is a pure interface, and one is a uh, pure just bunch of methods. All the methods accept as an argument the thing that implements the interface. And then the code that you wrote in the trait is there in the impl class, sort of with its perspective change to operate on the incoming argument instead of on self. This is how multiple inheritance is dealt with. So. This code right here is saying, OK, this is the trait initializer. That's called from the actual constructor of x. x was the thing that implemented this. That's the trait initializer. Something's going to come in. It's going to be a b. We're going to call this. Remember, by the way, that was not a var. That was a val, right? That was a permanent, never going to change val m. Even so, we had to give it a setter, because somehow we have to put the initial value in there. So here we are calling into the setter and passing 1. <laughs> to set m. Then here is x. x, of course, does not have what you might have imagined the field m, because it can't. There could be like 10 different traits that it inherited, each of which has a private m. And those need to all come together in the same thing. They can't all be m. So they have b dollar dollar m and c dollar dollar m. And of course, nice public getters and setters for b dollar dollar m. And then look at what the constructor does. It says, all right. Let's just get the construction ball rolling and now pass ourselves off to that method over in the impl class so that it can set our private final int b dollar dollar m. <laughs> and since it's private, we better have a setter so it can set it so we can pass ourselves over there so that it can do it. <clears throat> if this doesn't yet seem indirect, <laughs> the, the whole picture here is we are the only ones that can see this private field, but we, and then when our opportunity comes to set it, we won't. We'll pass ourselves off to somewhere else. They will call into a different method to set it, which has to exist for their benefit. 
What it all adds up to is there's no private in traits. You're dead. The only place where anything can actually keep its original name is in classes, which, you know, so essentially, like if you limit yourself to single inheritance or, and to stateless traits, right? Like if you don't have, if you just have methods, you don't have any vals, vars, or other things that involve uh, a field somewhere, then you're all right. But as soon as essentially you extend beyond what the JVM and Java have agreed on, then you get into this world. And it's, uh, quite difficult. Um, our problems with things like incremental compilation uh, stem in large part from this challenge. Because you just cannot touch anything without just this huge spin out of effect. Right? I mean, try and work on the compiler. It's comical. Like an incremental compiler, you can just go in there and just tweak a trade anywhere. And like, because it, one way or another, it shows up so many places, everything gets recompiled. One can uh, <laughs> witness this in <laughs> practice uh, quite easily. Uh, and as you would intuit, there's the name, since it was already encoded in there before, it probably still is. And if it doesn't agree with the class, abstract method error, beloved red abstract method error. Then there, the I turned into a J. Isn't it great that long is a J? It's <laughs> oh, I guess that's my last slide. So. Um, that's all that I have for you today, and uh, I'm very happy to take any questions on anything. Do you get the joke? It's funny. <laughs> it's funny. You'd be laughing hysterically if you got it. That's, that's what I'm going to say. I'm taking that to the user? grave. I'm sorry? Are you a VI user? No, no, no. <laughs> no. God, no. <laughs> I, no, I'm, I hate, I, uh, in the text editor wars, I take the position that I hate them, loathe them all with like equal passion. I cannot find in, like even on this, this long into this, I still can't find anything I like. I guess you'll see that in my later talk where I've got to like wing it on, you know, live. <laughs> Question, yes? Uh, if you add Scala all for yourself, let's say for a year, do whatever you want. Well, I guess I kind of have that, don't I? I mean, like in some sense, nobody will use it, but I, I'll, I'll have something all to myself. I don't know. I mean, I do know, actually, to a high degree of specificity, but it doesn't really lend itself to very quick answer. I would, I don't know, I would specify it better. I would disentangle things. Uh, it really, it comes down to like it's. There's just so many uncomposable elements at this point. Things where you, but where behavior has been bundled one way or another, and you can't disentangle them. Um, and so you just have these unrelated concerns going psh, 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 all over the place when you try to do something complicated. So I would just basically, to the extent possible, uh, build it out of compositional blocks and prove it on the way out. That's what I do. But I guess we'll see what I'll do. <laughs> hey, um, I'm trying to understand where you're going with this. Basically, uh, what's, what's the uh, summary? Uh, should we write in Java? Should we just be aware of all of these files? Be false, or uh, should we do something about it? Well, I guess so. If there was, like, I mean, the real the real lesson is sort of trying to like transcend Scala and Java specifically, and point out that you 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 cannot conceive of ideals, no matter how good they. If you do not consider what it will take to implement your ideals, you, then your ideals may be deeply flawed, and in fact counter to their own purpose, uh, because they may force you into places where you have to now like you know, stomp on your ideals in order to get out of what you've done. Um, if, uh, if you would like a more concrete uh, thing, it's probably not right in Java. Uh, but uh, in the context of Scala, like these, these, like these issues, most of these issues are plus or minus solved. I mean, it's not like we're like every day people are banging the door down over these. Um, these are just sort of imperfections in the process. So that's, uh, uh, that's, a, that's as much as like there's, there's no deep lesson when it comes to Scala and Java except to be aware that like, like, don't take too much for granted, I guess. <laughs> yes. Uh, so regarding binary compatibility, it seems like there has been quite an improvement since early versions of Scala, especially up to the left, uh, 210, 210 um, So one, how, are, how is that improvement? I mean, is, is it real? It's by, by not changing things. The, 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 essential, the essential way is, is by not, is, it's a process improvement. It's like, OK, we need to retain binary compatibility. So we'll put tests in place that make sure that we do. And then we'll do what we can within those constraints, which are very tight. And so that's why you, know, you look at the total amount of action in 2.10, and it's pretty minimal. And the place where we've done anything interesting, it was really difficult. So it's yet another time sink. You've got to do these crazy gyrations to keep binary compatibility. 
Um, so the, the essential problem is unaddressed. For, and then for library authors, um, would it be possible to put together like a set of best practices that if followed your, you know, could help you to write binary compatible software? Or well, uh, I mean, it, it's not, if you use MIMA, Right, I mean, like the, that's what it's for, is to tell you so that, like, at the very least, because the minimum standard here is, I know that I am binary compatible, right? And so MIMA will do that for you. Uh, you know, there are a few little tips that can be given about like things that are sure to burn you if, like, if that's your interest. But mostly, you're in a world of trade-offs, and so it's not that easy. Um, like, you know, traits are super useful, and composing via traits is super useful. Uh, and then it's very difficult to make changes after you're committed to something. I, I would say like the real essence of good binary compatibility is uh, indirection, right? Like uh, personally, I would write my sort of interfaces in Java, right? And that way, I know they're going to work from Java. Like if that's an interest to me, and then implement those interfaces and just try to keep enough layers between me and them that nothing's coming at my stuff directly. Then force everybody to write in terms of the interface. Never allow like intra talk between components. And you know this requires a lot of discipline, right? But it's you could get a lot further than you know, then you'll get naively if you took that kind of angle on things.